Good afternoon, everyone. And I, too, would like to thank Greg uh, for this magnificent day and weekend and for all of your efforts over the years. I only met Greg, uh, seems like I've known him all my life. And maybe we did know each other in a past life at the banana bar next to my mom's house. But uh, we just met a few months ago, and already we've worked on two projects and are talking about a few more. And when I saw him in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, I said, talking to Greg, you know anything is possible. And that's a gift. And so I thank you for sharing that gift, because my mantra is um, vision without implementation is just an hallucination. You can have all the vision you want. You can speak at all the caffeinia you want all day long, but unless something gets done, which I know is the theme of this weekend, then it was just a nice dream. And I'm, I really welcome the opportunity to talk to you about psychology and politics and influencing change, because it's something that we know about as Hellenes, and it's such an honor to be here amongst such terrific Hellenes. Um, I would love to just bottle that young man, Stephanos, as a cognitive psychologist. I know he single-handedly can counsel so many of my former patients in Canada. He's such a role model, and um, congratulations to the parents as well. Politics, as we all know, comes from the Greek word politis, meaning citizen. And politics are very personal. What motivates us all is quite personal, although not quite consciously evident. Our politics often goes back to our childhood. And so as I speak of my experiences for a few minutes, I want you to reflect on yours as well. What is the connection of your early years psychologically to what you are passionate about now, politically and otherwise? Because I firmly believe that tapping into that passion is the secret to success, whether it's public or private. And I also believe that as a diaspora, we are called upon to tap into that passion for our motherland. And we've heard from so many wonderful people uh, all day on their um, plans and their experience on doing this. And I will discuss my thoughts on this a little bit later in the talk. But let's go back for a moment to the beginning, my beginning, which I know reflects the experience of many of you here or of your parents, depending on how old you are. Like many of my generation, born in Canada to Greek parents from Crete, my first and only language was Greek until I entered kindergarten. I was painfully shy, and I did not speak up in class. In fact, every chance I got, I escaped from school and ran home to my yaya, my father's mom. The school often sent a grade six student home to get me, but I had successfully brought my yaya onto my side, and she would often tell the student to go away and leave little Marie alone, because she doesn't need to go to school. She already knows how to read and write, which was true, but I only knew how to read and write in Greek at the age of four. And the school didn't know this. I mean, how could they? So I was put in a slow learner's class in grade one. Luckily for me, my teacher noticed that I was not slow, and I was then put in a regular grade one class. I learned English that summer. I believe that is probably why I became a child psychologist and very definitely why my research was about assessment of children from different backgrounds. It certainly became my moral compass when I was the chief psychologist of our school board and had to advocate for thousands of vulnerable students. Perhaps that background, both in my childhood and then my adulthood, was always in my mind consciously or subconsciously, when I was given the task by the Premier of Ontario, who's sort of the equivalent of a governor here, to develop a law for people with disabilities that was fair and just and enforceable. I was a cabinet minister at the time, sort of like a secretary in the American system, in 2003. I started my consultations and heard many horror stories from people with disabilities that far too often, the reason why society, especially business, uh, pub, but also public buildings and work environments were not accessible to them because it was too expensive. I even heard of horror stories of mothers of disabled children losing hope and ending their lives and that of their children, the biggest tragedy of them all. As I was listening to these stories, I had a familiar ache in my stomach. Why am I feeling this way? It, yes, it's understandably unfair, but it's one thing to think something and it's one thing to, to feel it in such a profound way. And then I remembered, I started out in engineering before going to psychology in 1976. And some of the co-ops in industry were not available to the female students in the engineering program. 
And when we were asked why not, we were told not enough women come through here to make it worth the expense. I think if someone told any of our daughters today that they could not go somewhere because it isn't worth the expense to have female washrooms, there would be a revolution. I know I'd be bailing my 21-year-old daughter out of jail for sure if I wasn't in there with her. And that is when my mantra began to take shape. I found the teachable moment. I would say to everyone who was scared of the expense, imagine in 30 years from now, people will say, there was in Ontario a time, only 30 years ago, that people complained about the price of a ramp for wheelchairs, the cost of making a washroom accessible in private and public buildings. Hard to believe, isn't it? That is the vision that guided me, but I knew I had to tread carefully, communicate extensively, listen attentively, and achieve consensus among many groups. In the first ever formal meeting between the disability community and business representatives in Ontario, I saw that in the end there was over 90% agreement. The disabled didn't want to break business, they wanted to access business. The business people didn't want to exclude the disabled, they just didn't know what a difference a few accommodations could make. One senior executive summarized it perfectly. He said to me, Minister, as a businessman, you're scaring the life out of me. But as a father of a disabled girl, you're not moving fast enough. And that encapsulated the dilemma, the challenge. The next step to see is what the leaders of the world were doing. And I came to the United States first, because you were here, the leaders. And I saw that by making your restaurants and hotels just that, just that, accessible, and nothing else, you increase revenues by 12%. That's billions and billions of dollars, as well as the right and just thing to do. From Australia, we learned to give ourselves time. They had a 30-year timeline. We decided on a 25-year timeline. I learned from Great Britain, another leader at the time, that a deadline isn't enough. That the day before the deadline, people were saying, businesses were saying, we need to do what? From that, we learned that we had to have standards every five years or less until 2025. And I took the Environmental Protection Act from the United States as my model for doing that. And then came the gamble on my part. I'm Greek, after all. I brought all the parties together, government, private, and public stakeholders, disability groups, and told them that they would write the law together. They would have to agree on the standards. For example, how many accessible cabs should a, should a private company have, how many private trains, restaurants with ramps, menus in Braille, et cetera, et cetera. My pledge to them was that I would take that final product and sell it to Cabinet, the decision-making group in Ontario. I knew what I was asking was tough. I knew in the midst of deficit budgets, asking my colleagues at the Cabinet table to approve such a law would also be asking a great deal. My bureaucrats had costed it out for billions and billions of dollars for business to do this. I only had one request from everyone, and there were literally hundreds involved in this exercise for over a year. And these were people that weren't speaking to each other before this exercise. I said, please don't go public with your disagreements yet, because that could sabotage everything. And they succeeded in over a year of not going to the media. A few months later, they came back with a draft, and it was my turn. There are about 25 cabinet ministers in Ontario, one for each department, education, environment, etc., etc. I had each one of them to a nice lunch, because again, I'm Greek, individually to meet with their ministry department, transportation, for example, the disabled group, as well as business. And they had already agreed on the standards and told the minister that they needed his or her support. The citizens were, who came together and overcame their differences wrote a law themselves and kept it confidential for almost a year. They were asking support. support. So how could anyone say no? By the time it came to the cabinet table, most of my colleagues had heard their respective stakeholder group over a tasty lunch. There were no surprises. They had their chance to ask their questions. It was passed in cabinet, and I'm very proud to say it passed unanimously in the parliament. That rarely happens in Canada. It wasn't rocket science, it was psychology. It was respecting your fellow citizens and formulating an infrastructure where it was possible for people with perceived differences to come together. And it was about taking risks. One leak to the press, and the whole thing could have been sabotaged. One side could have been pit against the other. And that's all sometimes government needs to say 
Well, if they can't agree, we're certainly not going to fund it. And it was about trust, because if you give people a chance, they will do the right thing. I've seen it over and over again. The AODA, or this Disability Act, was just one example. I have a wonderful memory that I want to share with you during that process because it has to do with our Greek character and our ancestral homeland. When the law was first introduced in the Parliament, as Minister, it was my duty to travel widely and discuss the law and have final consultation, consultations open to the public before the final readings and royal assent. We have the British system, so we need royal assent before passing the bill. In one of the cities, I did a radio interview with two guests from the disabled community, and one was in a wheelchair. Somehow, the Athens Olympics came up, and I mentioned that I was there. The man in the wheelchair said that he was there and had an interesting experience. I thought to myself, okay, here we go again, and now I wonder if I will hear on national radio the familiar complaints about Greece how disorganized, et cetera, et cetera, and how much worse could it be for someone in a wheelchair? Instead, he told me this. I never felt more normal and more accepted anywhere in all my life. So, sorry. As I did in Athens. There were no ramps, and the lift to the Acropolis had a huge waiting line. But I didn't need any of that. Anywhere I needed to go, anytime, people would just get me there, spontaneously, carrying me, lifting me, laughing with me, inviting me to dinner, to clubs shrugging apologetically about the lack of ramps, but never making me feel abnormal. They teased me, I loved it. People here at home are afraid of teasing me, in case I'm offended. But isn't teasing part of life, and affection, and relationships? They included me. This gave me hope. Let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this honestly. It was kindness, pride in our heritage, and generosity and hospitality towards our visitors, attributes we are all known for as Greeks, that were at play here. As advanced as we are here with our laws in North America and elsewhere, this man felt the most normal and accepted and the happiest in Athens, not in Ottawa, not in Toronto. You can't legislate kindness. You can't legislate spirit and pride. You cannot legislate the psychology of a person or of a people. It has been developing and growing since birth, whether it's the birth of a person or a nation. And as Greeks, we have been developing this pride, this kindness, and this hospitality for thousands of years. This pride, and we've heard about it all day today, so well articulated by the previous speakers. This pride which is now dragged through the mud daily in the press. Of course there are many to blame. We know all too well about the culture of corruption, politically and otherwise. But there are many, many more people that are innocent victims who do not know what has hit them. Like the mothers of the disabled children in North America who once did not have any hope, many of our friends and loved ones have lost hope in Greece. There are many more, in fact, who did pay their fair share of taxes, who did work every day, who did save and sacrifice to send their kids to university, who do take care of their elderly parents, and who do vote in the hope that there would be a better tomorrow for their kids. They did play by the rules, but the rules changed in the last 30 years. A culture of corruption, entitlement, and greed took over. The rules changed, and so did the game. And it's so easy for us to be critical. And I, I'm guilty of falling into that pattern myself from time to time. But let's put aside the criticisms and ask ourselves, do our cousins, aunts, uncles, and friends in Greece deserve this ongoing mudslinging? Can our grandparents live on the reduced pensions while Swiss accounts are bulging with the proceeds of corruption? Is it any wonder that people have lost hope and in very dramatic style end their lives, some publicly? As a psychologist, I'm aghast at the rate of suicides in Greece. How can any of us, as well, accept the fact that there are Greek children today, in the year 2012, that are going to school hungry in our little country, where our hospitality in the past would not let anyone go hungry or unfed, even Axeno. Here are my thoughts of, as a psychologist, as a former politician, and as a citizen. I would hate to be living in a country where most of my taxes go to corrupt and greedy men and women and their plebes instead of going to better schools, roads, and hospitals. 
The solution, of course, is to change the system so that this is not possible, to make accountability and transparency priorities. This is important because there's only so much people can take. There's only so much a country can take before there is very serious civil unrest. And that, as we know, can lead to disaster. All of our ideas, if and when are implemented, will be needed and effective. But they will not be sustainable if things don't change. Someone simply has to pay for the corruption. Swiss accounts need to be opened, monies and taxes need to be seized, and if the courts find it necessary, guilty parties should be tried and sentenced. <laughs> the statute of limitations for politicians and former politicians need to be axed. And the sentences need to be implemented, period. In Canada, a 76-year-old senator was sentenced to six months in prison for falsely claiming $10,000 on his expense account. That's what I'm talking about. Only then will people begin to have faith in the system and to modify their own behavior. If there are no consequences to corrupt behavior, there will be no hope. There is a time to forgive and forget. This isn't one of those times. Too much has been taken away, and I see that the arrest of one former cabinet minister has made a start. But without axing the statute of limitations, it's just theater. The next step would be to have every successful candidate in the next Greek election, by law, declare their assets and their family's assets, the way we do here, as well as any contractual relationships between family members and the government. This could be confirmed by an auditor, an external auditor, and be published annually and posted on a website. Any proven fraud would be met with immediate consequences, political and otherwise. After leaving politics, ministers and their staff would not be able to lobby for themselves or for any entity they represent for at least one year after leaving office. And it should go without saying that while they're in office, they should follow that same rule. It sounds simplistic, but as a psychologist, I can tell you we're pretty simple as human beings. We want to be treated fairly as citizens. As citizens, that's what people with disabilities wanted. And that is what we all want. We need to trust that our leaders are treating us fairly. If we're not treated fairly, we make our own rules. That's human nature. And it was spoken about earlier. They do it because they can. And that begets a whole process of rationalizing everything, from cheating on our taxes to offering bribes, and yes, to accepting bribes as well. Will any party leader in Greece put these changes on their platform? If one leader makes trust and accountability priorities, the others will have to follow. Can we influence this through our many contacts, our own votes? We can vote, you know, in Greece. I think as Greeks, we can do anything. We're intelligent, creative, and generous as individuals. Remember the Canadian in the wheelchair who was the happiest and felt the most normal in Athens in 2004. That Greek hospitality and spirit is in all of us. Some of us went astray, we're human. And I say us because it would be hypocritical to make this an us versus them argument. So let's harness our energy, raise funds for those that need it the most, influence a change in the political system, and offer ourselves to assist in all of these. We can do it. We are Greek. We would be doing the work that is needed to be done, and isn't that what we are all about in the diaspora? We get things done. And it is the least we can do for a country that gave us our parents and grandparents who sacrificed so much to leave their country for us to have a better life. What an opportunity for us. It is work that at the end of the day leads to lives well lived. Our ancient Greek ancestors defined happiness as excellence in one's work. I wish us all continued excellence in this very sacred endeavor. Thank you. <laughs>